Good evening, each one. It's 7 o'clock. It's time for us to get started. Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate those who are visiting with us. We're studying through Brother Roger Hillis's workbook on developing positive Christian character. So tonight we're in lesson five on compassion. And we have covered thus far faithfulness, contentment, courage, and last week integrity. So almost halfway through the book, by the end of class next week, we will have completed half of it with those first six lessons. But when you think about developing positive Christian character, it takes a lot of, it takes effort, it takes work on our part, of course, in surrendering to the will of God and the qualities and characteristics that every Christian is called upon to uh, possess. And so compassion, when we say compassion, it's a feeling of deep sorrow for another who is stricken by misfortune, accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the suffering. I think this next slide kind of illustrates it well. We hear a pity, which is maybe I acknowledge your suffering, uh, sympathy, I care about your suffering, empathy, I feel your suffering, maybe you've been through something similar so you could, in a personal level, relate. Compassion, I want to relieve your, something, uh, your suffering. I want to do something about it. Um, so there is engagement there. Uh, there's a number of New Testament passages that mention compassion. And I ask you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. And after you get to Matthew chapter 9... Um, we'll look at a few scriptures here in Matthew's Gospel, Mark and Luke, and then some other verses in the New Testament. A couple of things mentioned on page 21 of our workbook on Lesson 5 of Compassion. Third paragraph, it says the word compassion means to fill with. If the per other person is suffering, he hurts also. <clears throat> and it also speaks of near the end of that Let's see, one, two, three, four, maybe the fifth paragraph. Um, it, it does carry with it the idea of helping others who can't help themselves and doing so because you care about them. All right, so we see this obviously a number of times throughout the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Here's one of those occasions in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 9 and in verse 35 and 36. Uh, Todd, do you have that? Yeah. <clears throat> Jesus was going through all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Okay. You really see his compassion even in verse 35, even though we don't read the word compassion. How do you see his compassion in verse 35? What's he doing? Not only is he teaching and preaching, of course, the gospel of the kingdom, but he's also showing compassion uh, on their physical circumstances. Yes, spiritually, I think there's definitely compassion, right? He's coming to save their souls by preaching the gospel. But he also is concerned for those who are diseased and sick and afflicted, and he's healing them of that. But then specifically with the regards to the multitude and seeing the multitude of the Jews and how they're scattered and weary, and he sees them as sheep that lack a shepherd. And they did. They lacked a good shepherd. They lacked the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. They had the scribes and the Pharisees, but those were bad shepherds. They were, that was the blind leading the blind, right? But with Jesus, he's the good shepherd who's going to give his life for the sheep, but he has compassion for them. And notice in chapter 14 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 14. And Ken, if you'll read verses 13 and 14, please. And when Jesus heard it, he departed from there by a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, to, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. All right. 
So that specifically states it. We referenced it back in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35, but here in regards to Jesus' compassion for them, he takes action, right? Remember, we kind of mentioned some differences maybe between the words pity and sympathy and empathy and then compassion. And something that I've, I've emphasized here and other places I've preached is when you just look for that word compassion, more than likely in that same verse or that context, it's when it mentions Jesus or someone else that had compassion for someone, you see them taking action. You don't just see them feeling sorry for someone. You see them doing something for them. And here specifically, he heals their sick. Uh, and of course, also, he feels bad because they've been with him and they're hungry. And so what's he going to do next? He's going to feed the 5,000, uh, not including the, the women and the children. And then in chapter 15 and in verse 32, you have that, Lena, you have that? Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, <clears throat> I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat, and I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Okay, so back in chapter 14, we had the feeding of the 5,000 here. What Lynn is reading in this context is the feeding of the 4,000 um, plus, but he has compassion on them because why? They continued with me three days to hear Jesus' teachings. They traveled with him. And now I don't want to send them away just hungry, lest they faint from that hunger. And so he's going to provide for them out of his compassion for them. And then in chapter 18, here we have the, this parable of the unforgiving servant. Remember Peter asked that question the, back in verse 21 of Matthew 18. Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? And then Jesus said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but to 70 times seven. And then he speaks this parable to them of this uh, king, certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And there's one servant who owed him an insurmountable amount of debt. He would never, ever be able to pay it off. And he pleaded for mercy. He pleaded for his master to have pity on him. And what do we read in verse, verse 27, Jesse? Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Okay. So he, he was moved. A lot of times you'll see those words together, right? Not just compassion, but moved with compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion and then moved to action because of the compassion that you feel in your heart towards someone. And so in this parable, obviously this picture is God being the king or Jesus being that king. And the compassion God has toward us sinners, and we can never repay or make up and, uh, the debt we owe because of our sins. Here's God's grace, here's His mercy, here's His compassion, and He just releases him. He forgives him of that, of that debt completely. Of course, the rest of the story is this man that received compassion then doesn't reciprocate that with a fellow servant who owed a very minuscule amount to him and faces the wrath of the king at the end of this chapter. And so we're told in verse 35, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Then in chapter 20 of Matthew, we have in verses 29 through 34 a brief account of these two men who are blind, crying out to Jesus to have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. The multitude tried to keep them quiet. But they cried out all the more. In verse 31, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. And he asked them, what do you want me to do for you? Of course, Jesus knew what they desired. And uh, Drew, if you'll read the verses 33 and 34, if you're there. And said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion and their, touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. All right. So again, Jesus had compassion and did what? He touched their eyes that they may receive their sight. Uh, come over to Mark's gospel now, Mark chapter 1. And let's do verses 40 and 41. Dylan, you have that for us? Mark 1, 40 and 41. 
leper came to him, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And moved with compassion, he stretched out his hand, and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. So there's those words again together, right? Moved with compassion. And this is a significant account when you think about a disease of leprosy and how no one would touch this man, how he's cut off from society. The lepers, according to the law of Moses, were to cry out, unclean, unclean. And so Jesus has compassion and touches him and heals him of that dreaded disease of leprosy. In Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 5 and... Mark, Mark Hudson, do you want to read that for us? So just real quick to recap what we have in chapter 5. And you might have a little heading to help you uh, to get this figured out quickly. But Jesus heals a demon-possessed man. And he wanted to continue on with Jesus. And Jesus in verse 19, what, is, what does he say there, Mark? Mark five nineteen. And he did not permit them. Permit him, but he said to them, "Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, and how He has had mercy on you." Okay, so your translation has mercy. Mine, New King James Version, I'm reading from, says, "And he had compassion." how he has had compassion on you. Um, is there application there for us, maybe? I mean, Jesus hasn't miraculously cast out some demon out of us, but he has cast off or taken away our sins that defiled us. And through him, we have a new life. Doesn't he have a new life now? Didn't he have... A, He's restored, and we've been restored spiritually by Christ and what He's done. And the mercy, the compassion shown us, shouldn't we naturally want to go tell others the good news and what Jesus has done for us, He can do for you. So I think there's application there, isn't there, of that mercy and that compassion we've received and that anyone can receive through Christ. Uh, in chapter 6, this is... Um, Mark's account of the feeding of the 5,000. And a little bit different than what is stated here. That's why I wanted to include it. Uh, Andy, if you could read that for us, please, in Mark 6 and 34. Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Okay, we, we saw that back in Matthew 9 about seeing the multitude like sheep, weary, scattered, not having a shepherd. But Mark specifically says in this verse, so what does he do? Begins to teach them. Other places we saw that he's, uh, as he sees those who are diseased and sick, that he's moved with compassion and he heals them. Here they need to be shepherded, they need to be taught has compassion, so he spends that time to teach them the truth, to teach them the Word of God, uh, to teach them the kingdom, about the gospel, the kingdom of God, right? And so that's another way that we ought to have compassion on our fellow man is share the good news with them, to teach, to preach the gospel as, as Jesus did here in Mark 6, 34, when he had compassion for the lost. Mark 9, 22 So here in Mark 9, we have his account of the Mount of Transfiguration. That has taken place, right, with Moses and Elijah appearing. Peter, James, and John were there. While that's going on, uh, down below, uh, as they wait for Jesus, some of his other disciples, there is a boy that is demon-possessed. Uh, they uh, fail in healing him. And this is brought to Jesus' attention and the father pleads with uh, the Lord uh, to do something, to help him. And so, uh, let's see, Norm A, are you able to read for us? So maybe 22, 
if you'll read that, 22 and maybe 22 to 24. Yes, sir. Uh, and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And of course, Jesus did have compassion on this family. And he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of this boy. And he healed him and restored him to his father. Uh, in Luke chapter 7, there is a funeral taking place in the city of Nain. There's a widow there, so obviously that implies she's already lost her husband. She now has lost her only son. She is weeping. Jesus, the coffin is passing before him. And what do we read in verses 13 and 14? Brent, are you able to get that? saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, Do not weep. And he came up and touched the buyer, and the bearer stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And here's maybe the kind of the ultimate way, right? Someone's lost a loved one, they've died, and Jesus has compassion. Do not weep. And brings the young man back to life, as he did with others during his earthly ministry. Uh, sometimes we sing the hymn, Does Jesus Care? I know He cares. And these inspired stories and text reminds us that He cares. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and how He demonstrated that time and time again on various occasions, different circumstances. But He had compassion. He had compassion for the lost, for the sick, for those who have uh, lost a loved one. Um, to give forgiveness of sins. And that's what we see here in Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, we had the parable of the lost sheep, lost coin, and lost son. Really, there was two bad sons, the older and the younger. The younger we usually focus on the most. I think Jesus probably was focused more on the older one because he represented the scribes and Pharisees uh, who murmured against Jesus because he would eat and receive sinners, they says, right? But he spent time with the sinners and tax collectors to teach them, to save them. But we have a picture of, of our heavenly father here with this earthly father of these two sons and the prodigal son uh, has come to his senses. He's, re, he's seeking to be restored, to repent to his heavenly father, to his earthly father. He's come back home and we read in verse 20 of Luke 15. Tim, you got that? He arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. All right. So you, again, you see the, the actions of the father, the son who's come home. He's a, he's a great way off, but the father, many times I'm sure going out there looking for him, hoping he would return and when he saw him, he has compassion. And what does that cause him to do, the compassion? Run to him, fall on his neck, kiss him, of course, bring the fatted calf, put a robe on him, ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, and then they celebrate, right? All that's connected to his compassion, but the forgiveness, he's come back home. My son, who was lost, has been found, as he would say uh, later, my son who is dead, is alive again. Uh, and then in Hebrews chapter 10, obviously going much deeper into our New Testament, but Hebrews 10, the author of Hebrews speaks of, say, let's see, Francis, can you do 32 through 34? But recall the former days in which after you were yeah, you endure a great struggle with suffering, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. 
treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyful, joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Okay, some translations have you had compassion on the prisoners. Uh, the New King James says you had compassion on me and my chains. But regardless, those who were imprisoned and seems to be in this connection with uh, suffering for Christ, but compassion uh, on those who were imprisoned for their faith. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, 1 Peter 3 verse 8, Bill, you have that? Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, Yeah, that's not nice to cut you off there. Go ahead and read verse 9 if you want. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit that blessing. So one of the general instructions Peter gives to the Christians he's writing is have compassion for one another. You know, we previously did our one another study. Well, here's one of those one another commandments or instructions given to all saints, and that is to have compassion for one another. And then in the short book of Jude, right before our final book of the New Testament, we find Jude, Jude, and of course just one chapter in verse 22. And we might read 22 and 23. Sister Rhoda, you want to get that or you want me to move on? That is fine. We accept that and we allow that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment that polluted their flesh. You no, know, can't accept it. I didn't have the word compassion. Um, no, it has mercy, which we had before. That's fine. Um, the New King James has on, on some have compassion, making a distinction. Um, and so speaking of those in, in spiritual danger, um, we need to care. We need to take action. Don't just ignore them. Have mercy. Have compassion. Some even you know, pull out of the fire, right? They're, they're uh, in a bad way. And we need to take swift and urgent steps and action. Just a number of the scriptures that mention compassion, but I, th I hope that you see as we read these and, uh, as, and pointing out context, if we couldn't immediately see it in the verse of verses we read, um, gives us some concrete uh, ideas and an under, a better understanding of what it means to be compassionate when we see it in the ministry of Christ, when we see it in some of these other later New Testament uh, scriptures. One of the points that Brother Hillis makes in this lesson is dealing with if, if a person is compassionate, then they're not going to be selfish, right? Uh, rather, they're going to be willing to sacrifice personally to help others. And this is back on the third paragraph of the first page of the lesson. And he is not concerned about the praise or credit he may receive from helping. His only motivation is to do what is best for another. And so on page 22, Two on the left margin of that page, it asks the question, are you selfish or unself, unselfish? And of course, a selfish person thinks only of himself. An unselfish person thinks of ways he or she can help others. And so what do these verses teach us about helping other people? And I'll put them, uh, the scripture references there on the screen. So just highlighting these real quick, um, and if you didn't do the lesson, didn't get a chance to do it, maybe you can just turn over there real quick. Some of you who did it will be able to give a quicker response. But Mark 10, 44, what does Jesus bring out there? We need to be what? Basically not to put yourself first. Okay. Don't put yourself first. What did you say, Clarissa? Servants. Servants, right? Be a slave to all. Be a servant to all. There in Romans 15, 1 and 2, what does Paul say? We need to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves, but please our 
neighbor for their good. Okay, so it's about others, not me. Galatians 6, 1. If a brother who has been overtaken by any trespass, you who are spiritual, do what? Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, right? So restore a sinning brother with gentleness. Um, and then in the very next verse, Galatians 6, 2, speaks of bearing Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6.10. We're to do good to all, especially to those of the household of faith, our brothers and sisters in Christ. So do good to everyone, right? That's kind of like love thy neighbor as thyself. But then making that more narrow, Paul says, especially we want to do good, of course, to our the family of God, right? To our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Hebrews 13, 16, what's God well pleased with? Such sacrifices he's well pleased with. What is it? Anybody remember Jesse's sermon? He preached all through, throughout the whole book of Hebrews in two lessons. What a, what a show off, I'll tell you. What a, <clears throat> do good and to share, right? Now, with those sacrifices, God is well pleased. Uh, James 2, 15 through 17. Of course, we got the faith and works text here, and it speaks of what? James 2, 15 through 17. Yeah, you, it speaks of this brother or sister who's without clothing, without daily food. And one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm, be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? And he says, That's also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So, point is what? I mean, compassion is not just speaking nice sounding words, right? Remember, we need to be moved with compassion. We, we see a need, we're moved by knowing about that need and having that opportunity and that ability, then we need to take action to alleviate the suffering, uh, to provide the clothes, to provide the food, uh, to help meet the needs of a brother or sister, as James says here. And then in 1 John 3, 17, very similar to, I think, what we have here in James 2, 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, and shuts, and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? So I see it, I know it, but I refuse to do anything about it for whatever reason or excuse or justification. Uh, John says, you don't have the love of God abiding in your heart if such is the case. You, and you don't have compassion in your heart because if you had compassion, that would move you to do something for them, right? To help them, to benefit them. All right, I went through these really quickly, but does anyone have any comments they want to add to any of this? Andy? I was thinking about the, uh, the rich man Lazarus mm -hmm. that tells that he's laid there at his gate every day, sees him, that kind of gives you the idea that almost that he, you know, walked over him yeah. to a certain extent. Right. Uh, and he had no compassion for him at all. You mm -hmm. know, he, here's a person he could, he could see that was in need but never, never showed any kind of anything that even put forth any effort at all. Yeah, that's a good text to bring up. That's, I mean, there's many more that could have rightly been included, but that one wasn't. So Luke 16 with the rich man and Lazarus and a total lack of compassion there for someone who was very well off. And here's a, uh, a beggar with sores and he wouldn't give him anything, even though he had an abundance, right? All right, Norm. One of those uh, characteristics that has to be learned. It's a we 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 start out very selfish, but that it, with with uh, uh, proper parenting and uh, associations, we we learn firsthand from the parent on the parenting part yeah. uh, from our parents, loving parents that. Uh, that what what it is that compassion is, uh, and illustrations of it and everything, and it's the starting point for for action. If, if you yeah. don't have this, you don't start. Yeah, the children should be taught it and should witness it and see it in the home with godly parents. They should hear it and see it on a regular basis through the, being taught the scriptures at home. 
in the worship assembly and Bible classes. Um, something we need to be reminded of often though and something that we can maybe have and then lose and cease to practice but it needs to be a regular uh, characteristic and a part of our heart and life. I want to come over to Luke chapter 10. Uh, you know this text well, no doubt, Luke chapter 10 with the parable of the Good Samaritan. And Brother Hillis wants us to notice the four different kinds of people represented here in this parable that Jesus teaches. Um, so Luke chapter 10, the text of the book says 30 through 37. I want to get more of the context, so I'm backing us up to verse 25. Um, Ray and Shirley, you okay with me moving on and giving you a break tonight? Or you want to read? You want me to give you a break tonight from reading? Okay. You good for reading? Okay. Clarissa, why don't you start us off and just do a couple of verses and we'll come back to Todd and Ken and make our way through the middle here. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to, te to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departing, leaving him half, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, and pouring oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Okay, that's good. And then 36 and 37, Dylan? Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell in the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Okay. Thank you all. And so he speaks of lonely people. Who's the lonely person in this parable? Sorry? The victim, right? The man who was attacked by the thieves and... Who are some modern day examples of this type of person? Do you think? Sure. Homeless, for sure. About widows, widowers, For fatherless, the orphans. Sorry? Okay, the elderly, a single person, one who's been divorced, one who is a Christian but maybe the only Christian in their family. It can be a big area of loneliness for them, right? Okay. Um, cruel people. I think it's obvious, but who are the cruel people? Well, we could maybe add to this, but I think what he's looking for. Uh, who are the cruel people in this parable? Okay, you have the thieves uh, who robbed and wounded the man, leaving him half dead. And... Uh, of course, I think the priest and Levite were cruel too, right? But um, who are some modern day examples of this type of person? There are plenty of those individuals in the world that are cruel, that are evil, that are violent, um, or just bullies, you know, whether it's at school or in the workplace, who are just ungodly, who are, use foul language against you or others, who are dishonest, who are mean-spirited. Um, sadly, the world is filled with cruel people, right? Um, selfish people. Uh, who are the selfish people in this parable? I don't be bothered with it. It's not my problem. I don't know what happened here. I don't want to get involved. I don't have time. 
I'm in a hurry, the schedule's packed. Uh, maybe those people that did it to him are lurking by, better keep moving, you know, all kinds of excuses or rationalizations to justify uh, why I, I can just keep going. So the priest and Levite who both passed by. Um, so modern day examples of this type of person. Anybody? Too busy to, to notice the need or to care about the need, to take the time to fulfill the need. Yeah. That's right. Um, so those, those who don't take or harm others, but they don't care enough to help those who are hurting or in need because, as we stated, they, they feel too busy, they're occupied with their own lives, don't want to get involved, it's not my problem. Lena? You can say that modern people, that's all of us and most of us, because there have been many experiments, and they would show that on TV when uh, a person would lay in the park and people would just pass by for hours and nobody would stop. Because, well, you don't know, maybe that person is drunk, maybe that person is on drugs, maybe that person is sleeping or whatever. And <clears throat> the experiment would be, well, if a person had a heart attack and he needed help, but nobody would stop because, well, we are afraid or we try to push ourselves away from that. And, hey, I would probably pass by because I wouldn't want to be attacked or wouldn't know what to do. Well, we see in the news all the time stories of people being assaulted or attacked, or um, and there's other, there's others around, but they they don't get involved, they don't intervene. Now they might get their phone out, right? And they might be uploading it to social media, they might be taking videos of it. But how sad! And and but there's exceptions. We do read of those who step in and are kind of the hero and come to someone's aid, or and sometimes they get uh, they might get be attacked for trying to help out someone. But uh, unfortunately, yeah, we 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 kind of hear about it and see it often and we don't want to be the priest or the Levite. I don't think we're going to be the person that goes and beats somebody up, robs them, leaves them half dead, right? But we may be that priest or that Levite. Uh, another hand went up. Francis? Well, this, is, this happened this morning to me and I was behind the vehicle and it had his flashers on and I went around to the side Rolled the passenger window down, and there was a young woman in there, had two kids, and she was just beside herself. And I asked her, I said, is there anything I can do? And she says, no, there's not, but thanks. And as I went by her car, I said, yes, there is something I can do. And I started then praying. Mm -hmm. So we can always, somehow, help. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we're told to pray for all men. And that would include the mother that you encountered. Uh, then the compassionate people, of course, who is the compassionate person in this parable? Yeah, yeah and of course, <laughs> Jesus intentionally, no doubt, used the Samaritan as the hero, right? He's talking to a certain lawyer who gives the right answer to his question about what shall I do, teacher, to inherit eternal life? He, he puts it back on what's written in the law, what you're reading of it. And he quotes, the, he gives the answer to those two great commandments that Jesus gives in his teaching. Love the, the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbors yourself. Jesus said, you've answered well, rightly. Do this and you'll, you'll live. Wanting to justify himself, okay, who's my neighbor? And he had to regret asking that question after Jesus told this parable, right? Because... The Levite and the, the, the priest, who you maybe would have thought would have helped these Jews, didn't help. But the Samaritan, as he journeyed there, he came where he was, verse 33, and when he saw him, he had compassion, so he went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured oil and wine, he sat him on his own end and brought him to an end, took care of him. Next day, when he departed, he took out more money, gave it to the innkeeper, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I'll, I'll reimburse you I'll, when I come back through, right? And so clearly, the only one that had compassion, showed compassion, was moved with compassion, was the Samaritan. Um, so what are some of the differences between the Samaritan and the injured man? 
Well, one was a Jew and one was a despised Samaritan. The Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, right? John tells us in John chapter 4. Uh, one was in need and helpless, and one had the ability, the desire, and the compassion to help, right? Who are some modern day examples of this type of person? You got seconds, so I need quick answers. Those who help others, visit maybe those in the hospital, visit those in the nursing home. Uh, those who text and call, those who are going through a trial or go visit them, take food to someone who's had surgery or is sick or just had a child, uh, sending an uplifting card to someone. There's very many ways that we can show compassion on others. What do Christ's final words in this setting mean to you in your life? Go and do likewise. Well, I need to love my neighbors myself and everyone and anyone is my neighbor and those who are in need and particularly need to go higher on my list to be merciful and compassionate in order to go, do and like, go and do likewise. So it's time is up. Barnabas has brought up the son of encouragement and all that we read about him. He was always helping others, wasn't he? And then this passage in Philippians 2, 3, and 4, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. All right, that's our time. And so next week, Lord willing, we'll look at this lesson six, moral purity, moral purity.